Maintainable Software Podcast, where we speak with seasoned practitioners who have helped organizations work past the problems often associated with technical debt and legacy code. I'm your host, Robbie Russell. On this episode, we are joined by Anne-Marie Kirby, who is the co-founder and CEO of Core Health Technologies, based in British Columbia. Anne-Marie, we appreciate you for joining us on Maintainable. Hi, Robbie. Well, thank you for inviting me. That's great. In an article you published in Forbes, you shared several tips on navigating the process of going into a software rewrite. Based on your experience, what are a few questions that teams should be asking themselves before going down that path? Well, the first one, most important one is, why do we want to rewrite? There has to be some very, very good answers to that. I know most people want to rewrite because it's way more fun than maintaining code. But what you need to ask yourself, do we need to rewrite? And what are some examples you've seen where your team or developers you were working with, you know, were strongly advocating for a rewrite, but you found that it wasn't going to necessarily solve the underlying problem? Or have you had some really good experiences from rewrites and can speak well to that? Well, I have had two examples where I was involved in a rewrite, so to speak. The first one, I was a fairly young developer and I worked on an accounts receivable system for a lumber company. It was a newly put together team and they were going to use this really cool new thing, Microsoft Visual Basic. They had gone from COBOL to that. So they put together a team. The team lead said, okay, we're going to start coding. And we practically started right away because it was really just redoing what they had before. But it seemed like Every couple of days, it was back to the drawing board. We've decided to change our interface. This isn't working. It was a real case of not thinking through all the repercussions of every single decision and making them on the fly. So that went on for weeks and weeks, perhaps even months. It was such a long time ago. I ended up leaving the company before we got anywhere. That's about probably six months of my life I'll never get back. <laughs> <laughs> You know, thinking back to that era where Microsoft Visual Basic was that was a new thing at the at that point in time. How did developers hear about new technology like that back in that era? Because that was, you know, obviously pre Google and Hacker News and other technology tools or sites and stuff like that. You know, I don't even remember. Um, to be honest, I am the type of programmer that likes to work from a template. I like to code. I like to code lots. I'm not a good person to put on the research end to go and fiddle around and learn new things. I'd rather just be totally productive. So that was never my department to research new tools. That's interesting. When you were a developer, do you feel like you like to work on existing code bases more often than, say, a brand new Greenfield application? No, I, I like the Greenfield application. I guess I'm more of a programmer analyst. So I like to listen to the business problems, understand what they're trying to achieve and build the code to match. But I, I like to take from an existing code base where I go, OK, I remember somebody did something like this over here or somebody did that. I've seen that once before and find it and replicate for new uses. So like some pattern matching and... Yes, exactly. Nice. Have you found that that's been something that you've been able to apply to different aspects of your roles over the years as your roles have evolved? I did, in one case, I did become a software architect and I had to build a whole new architecture. So that did force me into the research and the understanding and the reading the books and all that. And that was for a healthcare resource management system. Nice. What do you think is something that people often get wrong about technical debt? From the business aspect, in the company I'm in now, we deal with a lot of large organizations where they still haven't really caught on to SaaS, which is really disappointing for us. So our biggest competition is organizations that think it's cheaper to build it themselves. I think the biggest mistake people make is, okay, it's a software build. It's going to cost $5 million. They'll do it in one year. And then we're done, right? That is my expenditure. I can put it on my budget and that's what we have. So I think people don't even recognize technical debt from a business perspective. They're not accounting for the, how much are you going to be spending in maintaining that over the next several years? Yeah, they, they miss the whole point that it's out of date by the time it gets delivered, if not done properly too. Yeah, that's a good point. How long ago did you start building core health? And what kind of inspired you and your co-founder to begin building it in the first place? 
the co-founder and myself, we're both technical people. We've worked at a number of hospital information systems vendors over the years together. We've been working together now for almost 22 years in a lot of different companies. Being in hospital information systems was never my favorite thing. I got pigeonholed into it as a co-op student when I came out of school. It was just not a topic I like. Like I can't even take first aid without feeling weak. So Mm, when I... I'm with you there. (laughs) (laughs) That's why we're programmers. Um, Anyways, when I started to see prevention getting legs in the industry and people wanting to pay to prevent disease, I, I really started watching that market. And then employers started to get involved in it for their employees. And I thought, this is just makes so much more sense than building new hospitals. So it was about 15 years ago that we started Core Health. That was the inspiration to do it, just to make a bigger impact, really. As I was saying, the co-founder is another technical person. I joke around now saying that we drew straws. I became the CEO and he remained the CTO. And I still don't know who really won that one. And I don't think it's I don't think it's me. <laughs> When you started building Core Health, did you initially build that in-house or did you work with the external teams to build that? And what technology choices did you make initially with building? You mentioned as a SaaS product, so I'm assuming this is a web-based platform. Correct. We built totally in-house, being both programmers. We spent the first year or so actually coding before we got something to sell. So it was really the two of us. And we chose the Microsoft stack. It was .NET, and now it's primarily, you know, JavaScript, C Sharp is our platform. We're Microsoft Gold Partners, so we use everything that we can under that structure. It's very cost efficient, we'll say. And out of curiosity, knowing that you're working within the Microsoft space, have you found that there's been some benefits in recent years is that you've seen within your team as Microsoft has embraced open source more? You know what? I am probably a little bit too far away from the technology to speak to that. I'm not sure what Microsoft has done in that space. But being on the fringe of healthcare and dealing with a lot of healthcare organizations, the minute you say open source, it's like, oh, oh, we have to declare anything that we use that's open source. So because that's so traumatic, we tend to avoid it. I see. Is it safe to assume that Core Health has had its own fair share of technical debt over the years? And what sort of processes has your team implemented to help keep your platform's code base fresh and maintainable? Well, for one, we have an amazing CTO that pays attention to our infrastructure, makes sure that we're keeping our tools up to date, that our processes are up to date, our methodologies are up to date. I always tell people we spend about a third of our development resources on obtaining new customers. So to make our sales folks happy, you know, the new and cool things. About a third keeping our existing customers happy. So they're always asking for things. And then the final third, at least, is just maintaining our infrastructure and keeping it up to date, evolving it to new technologies, and just really paying attention to that. That's an interesting way to like kind of ration out how time is being used in terms of where you're spending that. And I hadn't heard someone break it down at least that clearly. I mean, I would assume this first several years probably was primarily on winning new customers. And then at some point you needed to make some decisions and process changes to be like, okay, let's, we have to take care of the customers we've made commitments to. We have to keep winning new work. And I don't know, I speak to a lot of developers that work in environments where they feel like there's a lot of pressure to just keep winning those new projects because they're chasing some sort of hockey stick growth or what have you from their sales department, at least that's their perception. The fact that you were able to kind of articulate it in that way makes me wonder if developers are spending enough time thinking about how much time is actually being spent on dealing with existing issues and internal maintenance type stuff versus providing support to existing customers and building out new features and functionalities. And how is that kind of ranked and can you measure that effectively? Yeah, it's worked really well for us being a platform delivery company, right? I'll tell you a funny story about it. A lot of our code was written over 10 years ago. I don't know what percentage, but we basically have not thrown out much code. We've evolved it and we refactor it constantly. Ultimately, a lot of it is still the same code that's over 10 years old. In 2011, we had a large company very interested in using our platform 
they hired a brand new architect who actually came to meet with us. And we talked a lot about our infrastructure because for these wellness companies, this is a critical application for them. So it's really important they make the right decision. So anyways, they really put a lot of effort into and due diligence with us. And the architect decided, well, you know what, it's a really old architecture it's old technology. We're not going to go with it. So that was, I think, 2011. They went off, they built their own platform. They've gotten rid of that platform. They've partnered with another technology. They've gotten out of that partnership. And I'm not sure what they're doing now, but we're still using that same code. And I tell you, it's fresher and more robust and more secure and more expandable, scalable than anything they're going to find because we've used that mindset. You know, I think if, if your customers are making decisions based off of their perception of a technical decision that was made several years ago, I think that's you're kind of missing the mark a little bit in terms of the technology choice or software tools that you're using don't necessarily reflect how well you use those tools or how well you're maintaining those tools. And, you know, a lot of COBOL applications still out there doing a lot of important things that have been built 30 plus years ago, or what have you. There's no reason to replace them because they do their job well. And it's like, what are you going to replace it with? Just because you can say that it's been written with something newer and that doesn't necessarily mean it's better or you're going to change your behavior as a development team on how you maintain those projects or keep them updated. And so I think if you have good process in place to keep things updated and secured and patch things and refactor and revisit things, and there's nothing wrong with having code sit there. From my perspective, I am trying to dismiss this idea that code that's been around for a long time and saying old, cold code shouldn't be perceived as a bad thing. A code that still works and it runs effectively and people can still understand it when they dive into that area of the code base and work on it, that's important. It is a fascinating aspect how people will write off things just because of some technology choice under the hood. And I, I think that speaks more about that organization's culture. I agree. Just because it's old doesn't mean it's no good. If it works, don't fix it, right? You just, you'll end up breaking it instead. Spending time and resources that don't need to be spent is kind of silly. We don't do that with like physical property in the same way. No one says like, well, this house was built with this older stuff. We need to just tear the whole thing down and you improve upon it. I don't think there's enough emphasis in our community that just because it's soft doesn't mean it's easy to replace. It's kind of being dismissive all the time and energy that people had previously put into that work. Why is that treated any different than some physical property or building that was built a thousand years ago that we care about? And if it catches on fire or we're concerned about it, why do we feel differently about software? And it's like, wow, it's just a bunch of lines of code you can throw away. But that was someone's craft. It is a mentality, isn't it? If you think of it like a house, you would only tear a house down if you had a really good reason. It's too small. It's falling apart. It's not working anymore. You don't look at a house and just want to tear it down because you've got a better idea. Or I want a bigger basement. You don't just like (laughs) knock the whole thing down so you can build a new basement. It's always amazing when I see houses elevated and they're getting lifted up. And I'm like, oh, that's a thing. Like they can do that with houses. We could do that with software too. Absolutely. And software is way more expensive than any house too. And it weighs less. So yeah. (laughs) Given that you've been in a leadership role with engineering teams for a number of years, can you share some ways that engineers have raised concerns about what they perceive to be technical debt that were less than effective? That is a tough one because there's really someone in between me and the development team now. So I don't hear firsthand from developers that often. See, I have to think back to like over 15 years ago. I think that developers need to think more in terms of dollars. Everything needs a business case. And if you don't prove the business case, especially C-suite people aren't going to listen. Like come with the dollars first. This is costing me this many dollars to maintain. If we spend this many dollars, which should be less, we'll have a much better solution And this is the evidence and proof why, because we did it over here, or I did it in another job, or someone else has done it. I think you just need to put together the dollars and cents on your decisions rather than technical elegance. I'll be back with my interview with Anne-Marie in just a moment. Hi, it's me, Robbie. I wanted to thank you for listening to the Maintainable Software Podcast. If you're finding these discussions valuable, please consider sharing it amongst your peers and or writing a review on Apple Podcasts to help spread the word. Go on, I'll wait. Also, if you have a good story or two to share about ways to improve the long-term maintainability of software, 
and might be interested in being a guest sometime, please get in touch with me at Robbie with a Y at maintainable.fm. And with that, back to our interview with Anne Marie Kirby. One of the things that different folks that I've spoken to about this, I think there's usually like, oh, there's an issue we need to take care of. And they're like, we need, we should deal with this problem. And and this is causing me pain or some friction with our internal process. And that's slowing us down and maybe costing us some time, which translates to some financial amount of money companies spending on basically deciding that they're going to continue living with that scenario. One piece of advice that I've heard people talk about was, what if you framed it of just focusing entirely on the upside? Hey, if we get this done, we're going to be able to ship features faster. Or we're going to be able to take care of these things faster and not necessarily needing to carry on this, all this baggage of like, here's all the complaints I have about this past thing. It's more like, this is what we want to do. This is how it's going to make things better. This is how much it's going to cost to do that or how much we're going to save because we do this. And it's kind of focusing on the upside of it versus meddling into the, how much is this feeling like it's just complaining or not and as C-level folks, there's obviously a need to try to see, under, understand what the underlying issue that they're and try to help translate that if they're not necessarily the best at articulating that. But I think that that's been one piece of advice that I've heard people talk about as well. Yeah, that's a very good point. It's kind of funny because having started this company, we now have 30 employees. With two technical people, we talk about how programmers are pretty pessimistic. Like, I'm not going to lie. We we know things don't work. We know things break. So we grew this company really slowly over the years rather than jumping in like a business student, maybe. I agree. So because we're pessimistic by nature, we tend to look at the downside rather than the upside. I've heard a saying before that I think applies, and that's like, bring me solutions, not problems. And that's true. We would much rather hear about solutions and how they translate into dollars, like we can't forget that part. But yeah, the things that you can do, we can sell more, we can make our customers happier, we can do this, we can get things done quicker. That is a really wise way to look at it. I agree. Part of the painting a picture and sharing that you as a developer understand the future vision of the organization and how you can contribute towards that. And you're like, I'm making decisions that help drive us in that direction. You know, outside of making some monetary decisions about that, I don't know why any C-level person would be like, I don't want to hear about that right now. You know? No, totally. That's a good way to befriend people up, up the ladder for sure. <laughs> I think there's always that worry that developers or people and they don't want to be heard or, you know, you bring up the pessimism type thing that makes me wonder kind of like a related thing. Have you found, I know that you have someone that's working more closely with your engineering team throughout your career. Do you feel like you've noticed a difference between say junior mid-level type of software developer versus more of a senior level of software developer and how they think about technical debt and or these types of challenges or what they're willing to take on? Do you feel like one tier tends to be more pessimistic or complain more about technical debt versus living with it? Well, I'm going to say that I think the juniors are pretty optimistic to begin with, and then we beat them down until they become (laughs) cynical seniors. (laughs) I don't know. It does seem to be just the nature of the person. I guess the more senior you are, the more you believe in all the things that can go wrong because you've seen so much, just wiser, I think, when you're senior. So let's imagine that there are a few developers listening to this episode. They've been at their company for a few years now and don't feel like their concerns about the long-term maintainability of their code base has been heard from upper management. Perhaps they've tried a few times to advocate for refactoring areas of the code base, improving the test suite, upgrading the framework they're using, but have heard not right now a few too many times, feel like it's no longer worth asking about. Before they decide to go look for a new job, what advice might you offer them on how to take some action today? I think really what we were just talking about, going in with solutions and the upside of taking the time, it is a really tough sell. I'm not going to lie. When you tell somebody we need to do a release and nobody's going to see anything new and it's going to take eight months and nothing's going to happen. It is hard to sell that to the business folks. So you really do have to focus on what the advantages are of doing it are and what can go wrong if you don't. I am sure there are so many examples of software bases that weren't maintained well that have gone extinct and companies go with it, right? And it depends, I guess, too. I'm thinking and talking in terms of a company that their business is their software. It's way easier, I think, to make that decision than when you're with a company where 
they have a separate business and it's just like, okay, well, we just need some software, get it done rather than this is our beautiful piece that people will have to love and use for us to make money. But then also, I think there's a lot of startup companies that are being run by people that don't have a technical background and they're in the tech space that don't know what's going to happen because I hate to say it, but I've seen so many companies go under in the tech space being run by non-technical people because they just don't get it. So if I was in that situation, I might be um, dusting off my resume. (laughs) If you can't make that clear to people and they're just trying to sell it, I think that you'd be at risk of, of your job. But there's so many good books nowadays that people can read about this. So I don't know, maybe hand your uh, boss uh, one of these books for Christmas or for their birthday. One of my philosophy questions now is like, what books do you find yourself recommending to software engineers most often? Now my books are all pretty out of date. What do I have here? I have things now like The Culture Code, Make Big Happen, Hit Makers, The Art of the Start. Oh, here's one that might be of interest. Jane McGonigal, Reality is Broken, Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. You know what? I'd have to go back and dig out some of my old books. These are all too businessy. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, there's a couple good ones in there. You know, I remember uh, The Art of the Start came out early on when I first started my company and first started hiring people. And that was like going through this whole phase. I'm like, oh, maybe I'm kind of a startup, but you know, I run an agency. So I'm, it's a little bit different, but definitely some gems in that helped inspire me at the time. So best book ever, <laughs> I'm going to say. And where can uh, people learn more about you and Core Health? Well, our website is corehealth.global. All right. Well, with that, uh, it's been such a joy speaking with you, Anne-Marie. Thanks for joining us on Maintainable. Thank you, Robbie. And I look forward to hearing your other podcasts.